Hello, this is Mike Wilkes, Chief Information Security Officer at Security Scorecard, and I'm here to talk with Ryan Slaney from our Threat Intelligence team about some of the things that you might want to be considering given the recent rise of a, a, a persistent threat actor named Lapsus. So Ryan, thank you for uh, taking time to talk with me right now. Yeah, no problem. It's a pleasure to be here. So the first question for those that don't know, um, what do we know about Lapsus? Who is Lapsus? They're a, f a fairly recent uh, player uh, in the APT space. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, they are very new on the scene, essentially. So we've really only officially heard of Lapsus uh, as of December 10th, 2021. That's when they started their Telegram channel, what they use to kind of advise of the breaches and the, and the victims that they have. They also use it to... Uh, answer questions and even uh, take polls of their customer or sorry of their followers of whose uh, information they should release next but our research has actually shown that they've been around a little bit longer than that so we can see earlier signs of their existence back to june 2021 mm -hmm. uh, and that's in association with a, a hack against electronic arts uh, fifa 2021 source code the uh, very popular soccer game that was released oh i heard about this one they bought a ten dollar slack token and socially engineered themselves into a $28 million theft. Exactly. So an extremely unsophisticated, very inexpensive uh, attack vector to develop and exploit. And it was very successful in this case. So they, they entered via Slack. They were able to use some social engineering to uh, get, into, uh, get into more information, more data from user accounts, and ultimately got access to the source code. What I had read was that they knew that the customer support team had had a party the night before they reached out. And with this Slack token, they were able to send a message to the support Slack channel saying, I lost my phone last night at the party. Can somebody reactivate my new mobile number? And so that's how they social engineered themselves into a multi-factor auth setup, right? That's exactly what they did. So it was extremely smart. Not very technical, but again, uh, highly successful. So it's a classic example of social engineering, understanding their target, doing some research on what uh, went on you know, previously, the events leading up to uh, the next day. And obviously they took advantage of the fact that there might've been some foggy heads in the ID IT department that day. And we're able to get in and get a, and get a foothold. Um, so the, that was the first time we heard the name lapses because in chat online chat groups, uh, a individual or group using the call sign lapses was who took credit for that account for that uh, okay. leak. And um, one of the things I thought was interesting, some of the um, advanced persistent threat groups uh, are low and slow. They don't want to give away their presence. Um, APT 29 uh, with the solar winds attack and backdooring the software enabled them to get into FireEye, for example, and they didn't want to blow their cover and just do a smash and grab. And so they were able to remain with remote, you know, and persistent remote access. And that to me, I think characterizes the actual definition of advanced persistent threat. And so Lapsus, I think is a little bit different because it feels like their event horizon is to capitalize much more quickly on what they can do with the credential that they've breached um, within the next six to 12 or 24 hours. So I don't know that I would call them in the same category of these other APTs. Would you agree? I would definitely agree with that. Uh, they're not, they wouldn't be considered as an advanced persistent threat. Uh, advanced tactics, no. Um, they're using social engineering. They may be good at it, but it's not an advanced technical threat. Mm -hmm. The persistence mechanism isn't of their own making. So it could be because they've compromised an account and they forwarded some, some emails and uh, inboxes to maintain the persistence, but it's not an advanced way of uh, maintaining persistence. And you're absolutely right about the behavior. It's not low and slow, it's completely smash and grab. It's we've compromised this, what can we take advantage of? What can we get out of it immediately in order to get attention, um, not only of the victim, but of, of cybersecurity researchers, news media, everyone else. They're more than willing to answer questions from pretty much anyone on their Telegram channel, whereas a state-sponsored APT is never going to own up to any activities they've conducted, let alone uh, answer questions about them publicly. Yeah, and we did learn um, through unsealed um, indictments recently that these are literally script kiddies, right, below the age of 16, doing clever things, hacking billion-dollar organizations. And it really, I think, makes us think twice about some of the qualifications that we might be looking for for threat intelligence you know, and InfoSec professionals. You don't necessarily need to have 10 years of experience and a certification to do this work.
No, absolutely. And it, it does show the, the importance of uh, defending your networks from social engineering attacks, because a lot of times uh, CISOs will want to overlook this, this part of the penetration, uh, penetra penetration testing process. Uh, frankly, because it, it, it makes the victims feel uncomfortable. They feel duped. Uh, and organizations don't want to put their employees in that situation for testing purposes. So they often leave that out of the contract. Whereas that is often the biggest breach that you could possibly suffer is the, the user, the human behind the machines that have access. They're always going to be your weakest link, no matter how good your technical defenses are. Yeah. One of the ways I've heard it best put, I think, is identity is the new perimeter. We're not really interested in perimeter-based security models now, certainly with zero trust architecture, everyone moving things to the cloud. So I think one of the biggest concerns for CISOs right now, given uh, the nature of lapsus, and even if lapsus has been <clears throat> rounded up, or at least some of the members have been um, charged and identified, there's other groups that are going to do the same thing, right? And so we should be thinking about how do we protect? Obviously, security awareness training and phishing tests, uh, it's no longer an annual thing. I think at least 60, 70 percent of companies are now doing monthly phishing testing, as do we. And I think it's important because you need to flex that skepticism muscle. You need to see plausible calls to action and learn how to not click on them because we can't really blame people for clicking. A computer is really just a clicking machine. And so we have to kind of accept the humanity of our colleagues. And that's one of the reasons why we try to incentivize people to report phishing emails and to have that collective um, awareness of what's going on. Uh, but let's turn real quick um, to uh, the A Okta incident, uh, because this involves supply chain attack where the weakest link was not Okta. The weakest link was one of its subcontractors. Yeah. So, again, uh, you know, very interesting, namely because the target and Okta, what they do and what they provide to their clients, they're a third party identity service uh, provisioner essentially used by uh, you know hundreds or sorry thousands of, of customers at this point so mm -hmm. really anytime you have an uh, uh, authentic uh, or authentication entity third party that's been compromised it's going to be a pretty serious deal uh, and in this case what we saw too is a very kind of uh, slow response from Okta themselves in terms of the the breach they didn't really formally respond or acknowledge what lapses had claimed they had done for uh, I believe 10 days or so afterwards. And even then it was a very small response. It was, oh, we don't believe much as a, uh, had been compromised when it, in fact, it, you know, almost 400 of their customers were directly compromised by the, uh, the lapse uh, in security that they had at their subcontractor. So they did, it was a fairly big deal. I'm sure it's a big deal for the customers who were affected. Um, and again, I, Okta really needs to take serious that just because it's a third party provider doesn't let you off the hook to your customers. You are ultimately responsible for their data. Uh, and again, you need to be sure that all your vendors, all your suppliers are, are taking the, the due diligence and due care to make sure that their uh, security is as, as strong as can possibly be and that their users are trained to uh, recognize social engineering attacks as well. Yeah, I wonder, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a service that could help you monitor your third parties and understand their security posture changes? Um, but anyway, that's our, our ratings platform. And of course, you know, if you look at the scorecard for Citel, right, um, and Sykes, uh, the subcontractor, they had a poor score for the last 12 months. And it's interesting to think about, in my mind, the subcontractor wanted to have good latency, right, low latency, uh, on the Okta tool set. And so they actually set up, from what I read, uh, their own RDP Windows machine in AWS. And then they were RDPing in it from South America. I think it was Costa Rica. And in this case, they were you know, doing their work. And so it was the remote endpoint RDP connection that had been breached, not the actual Okta controls that were running on that virtual machine. Obviously, it's important to monitor your third parties, but also your fourth parties. Meaning if you put Okta into one of your portfolios on our platform, you, you want to then be able to discover who are their providers, right? And their subcontractors. And so we have uh, auto vendor discovery, AVD, uh, as part of our platform to help you actually know how to find fourth or nth parties, uh, which are the vendors that your third parties are using to deliver their services. Yeah, it's absolutely an amazing tool. It'll help you uh, determine that third and fourth party uh, liability than vendors that you wouldn't normally have access to or have any other understanding of. And this automatically would do it for you. Um, and again, show you where the weak points are in any kind of strategically important supplier. And, and again, their supplier, the people they do business with, 
which you may not normally know. And so our ratings platform <clears throat> is mostly what we call a left of boom uh, uh, technology. Boom being when the shit hits the fan and a breach or event happens, an incident or something. And But we recently acquired a, an organization, um, a really well-respected uh, DFIR, uh, Digital Forensics and Incident Response uh, called LifeRs. And so now we actually have a right of boom service protection and offering for those people that have been breached and need help. So thankfully, uh, we didn't receive an email from Okta saying that our platform had been one of the 366 companies that they believed had been compromised. Uh, but maybe some of the people listening you know, out there or watching now did get that email and didn't have a retainer uh, for a DFIR uh, organization on hand to begin investigating. So my first advice to anyone that was looking at when it was an alleged breach and it hadn't been acknowledged yet by Okta was simply to go in and make sure that you review your administrative access logs, make sure that the remote access um, features for debugging and support via Okta are disabled, which is a default, um, but it's always good to check the defaults to make sure they haven't changed. And then just review all of the access tokens that have been created since January. Uh, so that was my basic advice for what CISO should do in the Okta case. Uh, but if you're thinking that you're going to be targeted uh, by a group like Lapsus, uh, besides having good monitoring in place and good incident response and training and testing people, uh, what else have you seen in your threat intelligence work that can help CISOs um, prioritize you know, the vulnerabilities that are being actively um, you know, probed and prodded, for example? Ooh, in this case, it's tough because they, there was no zero day. There was no malware or real technically advanced issue that you can quickly solve by patching or shutting down a port or uh, you know, upgrading a piece of uh, outdated equipment. This was um, you know, a very simple, again, a $10 cookie that was bought off the dark web that was replayed into a, a Slack conversation where they were able to go from there and get the access they want. So again, uh, having the awareness of, of dark web capabilities and what people may know about your company out there is obviously extremely important. Uh, so knowing that there is cookies that can be purchased online, had you known that you would, you would, uh, term it, you would have uh, expired those cookies right away and, and not, they would never have been able to be uh, used uh, legitimately again. That's true. In the case of electronic arts, I don't think they had an enterprise subscription with Slack, which gives you the capability of setting session policy and to have those session tokens be expired. Because at the moment, a lot of people's Slack instances have forever tokens, right? Unless you actively go in and expire them yourself with a script through the API or something, you're, you're running the same risk and exposure that, that Electronic Arts had. Yeah, and, and we've seen this before. I mean, some of, some of the major hackers, uh, and, and it's funny because they're usually younger that aren't technically advanced have used this method before. So several years ago, there was another hacker known as uh, Kareem Baratov, who was arrested just outside Toronto uh, for his role in the uh, in the Yahoo hacking. That was, I believe, 32 million customers had their had their credentials leaked, and that was all back to the a cookie replay that they were mm -hmm. doing. They were able to find a very small niche exploit. And, and use that. And in this case, it was actually taken advantage of by a state-sponsored Russian cyber actor who found this particular hacker and paid him to use that technique to go after millions of email addresses, many of which were important targets to them. Indeed, I think that's one of the assets that not everyone is keeping track of as well as they should. We think about passwords and we think about MFA, but MFA can be bypassed. And in some of the uh, DEF CON, you know, gatherings and, and RSA conferences uh, and presentations that I've seen on it. Uh, it's, it's, there are some techniques. I think one of them was even FireEye had their MFA bypassed um, and someone had basically minted a golden Kerberos ticket. And so they were bypassing these protections. So our, our ability to observe those types of events um, is, is going to be limited if we don't even think to review and to you know maintain you know token and cookie management um, for these types of uh, tools that have these deep integrations. Um, moving forward to the the last bit, I want to discuss with you. Uh, so, if Lapsus is kind of the new kid on the block, it's not terribly advanced, but it is using tried and true social engineering techniques, and it's basically you know able to get a lot of mind share because they're using Telegram and they're almost a, a brand um, that's marketing itself by using that platform to communicate. Uh, what can we do to mitigate some of these risks? Because in my mind, it's not 
the sexy zero days like you were talking about, right? That um, someone's taking advantage of and exploiting. It's really just the basics of DNS hygiene and using HSTS headers to encrypt and make sure all of your web traffic is protected. And those are the things that our ratings platform you know, is able to surface. Uh, but what would be your last um, uh, recommendation for folks uh, uh, to learn from you know, this incident and this new trend, I guess you could say, uh, that not all advanced persistent threats are advanced or persistent. Some of them are moderately talented and they just come and go quickly. Yeah, I think uh, what's important to remember is the motivation of these individuals. They may not have the skill or the technical know-how, but they're motivated to make a splash. Uh, to make money off of uh, any kind of flaws or misconfigurations that they find that's out there. And they're, they're clearly not uh, scared of the consequences of being arrested or, or being caught. At least it's not evident that they are. So I think mm -hmm. that you, you mentioned this is a hot trend. I think this trend will stick around for a while. We're going to see lapses uh, motivate you know, other copycat-like actors to conduct these type of conduct, uh, attacks in the exact same manner because, you know, the media... Uh, other security agencies have, have, you know, have detailed how these attacks were done. And it, again, it's not very sophisticated. Really, anyone with any kind of basic knowledge of uh, computer security could, could replicate these attacks. So it's something that we'll likely see uh, more and more. I think we'll see people more or at actors that are more emboldened to engage with the public and get the spotlight. Um, but the, at the same time, um, we haven't seen any evidence of lapses actually being paid for their efforts. So they were bold and they created a big uh, wave and a surge in the media of reporting, but ultimately uh, there was no evidence that we could find that they were ever actually paid for any of their attacks. And there wasn't a massive gap either between the time that they would advertise having breached a company and then disclosing that information. And usually these actors are in it for financial gain. They, they won't disclose until they're sure they're not going to be paid. This particular mm -hmm. chance, to, it didn't seem like Lapsus had actually given any time to the companies to even make that decision. So that's a little bit scary when you think maybe you can buy some your way out of something. And in this particular case, it doesn't look like you were able to, even if you want it. Um, and I think that that trend may stick around again. Maybe it's not financial motivation. It's more attention seeking or the thrill of being able to compromise and, and disclose that information as well. Um, in, you know, in conclusion, I think that the, the best thing to do would be, again, be aware of your own vulnerabilities using, uh, you know, products such as our own that, you know, will, will scan across your domain automatically looking for vulnerabilities that actors may be currently taking advantage of. Um, but again, it's, you touched on it earlier, Mike, you said an incentive environment. I think that's extremely important as a, as a CISO is creating a culture of awareness and reward for, uh, incidents, cybersecurity incidents. So people that, hey, is this a phishing message? I, I don't know. Even if the CEO messaged them uh, about some weird requests, they should have the authority to question that email and see if it is actually authentic and be rewarded for doing so versus being, uh, you know, either uh, punished or, um, or, or question the themselves. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah I, I think that goes a far way. You know, a $10 Starbucks, Starbucks gift certificate for someone that reports a phishing email is a really good way to keep employees who are your front line uh, in, the, in the cyber defense world are on guard and really looking for those phishing emails and, and reporting them in. Yeah, I think the collective um, defense approach, uh, in, in, in some of our recent phishing tests, we had more people reporting the test than clicking on it. And it's important to have that kind of capability built into your platform that you're using for phishing tests um, to report. It's usually called like a fish alert button or a, a fish me you know, kind of link. It automatically downloads the attachment with all the headers and sends it off to the InfoSec team to analyze because just forwarding the email is not sufficient for us to do an investigation. Uh, but I'd like to wrap up with a couple of stats that I like to repeat, and they've changed recently. Um, our, our ratings platform is scanning all of IPv4 every day. Security Scorecards is in the business of identifying risk and helping people mitigate it. And what we see is between 50 and 60 billion vulnerabilities every week across all of IPv4 space. We map that back into a letter grade for about 12 million scorecards. And each one of these shows you the exact detail of the observation and the vulnerable IP and how to remediate it. The other piece that we have is this uh, 
this sinkhole infrastructure, a top five sinkhole by some measures. And we see about 700 million events coming in per day from our sinkhole domains. Now these are command and control beaconing out, you know, malware that's saying, okay, I'm here, what should I do next? So given all of this risk, just a couple of months ago, I was reporting that as maybe 40 to 50 billion but now it's already increased. So if you go to our trust portal, trust.securityscorecard.com, you can actually see all of these numbers updated every day and the number of customers that are using our platform and the number of hopefully remediations and steps they're taking to fix these vulnerabilities. Because these again are basic things, not the sexy zero day, you know, breaking through, you know, hard, you know, elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman encryption or something like that. It's just someone misconfiguring something, having a domain that gets hijacked because they didn't put a DNS lock on it, or not even using HTTPS, right, or, or SPF records to stop email spoofing. Uh, so I would encourage everyone uh, to check out your scorecard. It's free, and you can see what the bad guys can see about you and hopefully start doing something about it. So thank you, Ryan, for taking time to talk with me and and go over some of the lessons to be learned from Lapsus, Okta, and, and the electronic arts uh, breaches. Thanks, Mike.